This is Module 7, Coronary Vessels, Anatomy and Pathology. Module 7B, Coronary Artery Calcification. This is an overview of the development of atherosclerotic plaque from its earliest appearance through the development of myocardial infarction or obstruction. Fatty streaks can occur relatively early. They can even be seen in newborn individuals and then disappear and may reappear around age 7 to 10. Later on, the development of abnormalities within the walls of the vessel can become quite apparent, which are contributed to by a variety of well-known risk factors as well as other factors related to uh, influences of environment as well as heredity. The classification of atherosclerotic lesions uh, was initially put forward by Herbert Sterry and have now been adopted as American Heart Association classifications class 1 through class 6. It is well known that Calcification of the coronary arteries can occur relatively early, roughly at STERI class or AHA class 3, and that calcification alone does not represent an advanced lesion, but does represent a relationship between probably prior events that include inflammation, repair, localized plaque rupture, inflammation and repair, etc. Later on, as the plaque continues, coronary remodeling, positive coronary remodeling can develop where the artery actually gets thicker, even though there may or may not be any encroachment on the lumen. Once the plaque reaches a particular set point of size, uh, probably when it becomes much more lipid-rich than uh, just having other materials, it becomes uh, vulnerable. STERI class 4 to 5 or AHA class 4 to 5 lesions fall in the vulnerable or potentially vulnerable type plaques. Once this rupture occurs, a series of events uh, continue to either plug up the area with a thrombus or a formation of a complete thrombus through the vessel lumen, thus resulting in a myocardial infarction. The presence of obstructive disease should be considered an advanced case of atherosclerotic disease. Coronary artery calcification has been known for about three centuries. Sir John Hunter suffered from angina and an autopsy. He was found to have ossified coronary arteries. Stokes performed an autopsy on a man who had had angina. He noted that the coronary arteries were so completely converted into bone as to be quite solid. Virchow, in his classic text, Cellular Pathology, found the coronary arteries in atherosclerosis to represent an ossification and not a mere calcification, the plates of which pervade the inner wall of the vessels and are real plates of bone. Over the past 10 or 15 years, it's become clear that coronary artery calcification, calcification of the aortic valve, and other areas of vascular calcification are in fact very, important, very importantly related to the development of atherosclerotic lesions. Hardening of the arteries then has been known again for hundreds of years, but only over the past decade have we found this to be an active, not necessarily a passive process. It can occur relatively early in atherosclerotic plaque development. It is an intimate part of fibroproliferative and inflammatory pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease, and it also appears to be regulated in a fashion similar to bone mineralization. In the adventitia of many coronary arteries, one can find osteoclast activating factor, osteopontin, and a variety of other uh, osteoclastic active hormones. This is an example of a, a histology 
through a particular cross-section. On the left, this shows a very advanced lesion with this very small crescentic area at the superior portion of the section, confining only showing the lumen. The relatively light yellow material is what we all know by the Greek word for gruel or lipid. The black-green uh, areas surrounding the lipid core are actually called calcium hydroxyapatite. This same histologic section then was exposed to an x-ray where one then can look at the coronary calcification within the area. Very important to understand that the calcification that we talk about when we use cardiovascular CT is not so-called calcium like we see in many other areas, but is actually calcium hydroxyapatite. Using uh, the same uh, research uh, that gave the slides on the previous uh, discussion, this shows an example of a distinct relationship between each individual three millimeter uh, section showing in yellow uh, the plaque area defined by uh, uh, planimetry as well as the calcium area and exactly the same section defined by contact microradiography. In this particular example, you can see that there is an astonishing relationship between plaque area and calcification area. However, there also are also some very important lessons to learn. First of all, one can have plaque without calcification, but as we learned very early in our anatomic evaluations, calcification noted in a coronary artery is a definitive definition of coronary atherosclerotic plaque. We further extended our relationships to look at calcium area and plaque area. Plaque area is measured by histology and calcium area now not measured by x-ray but by measured directly by means of cardiac CT. Again, there is an excellent but not perfect relationship between calcium area and plaque area. This information was extended to living patients where we looked at the extent of calcification defined by cardiac CT and compared it with the number of coronary segments having plaque by measurements using direct intravascular ultrasound imaging. Again, a linear correlation is quite apparent. These data and many other data then shows us to conclude that the amount of coronary calcium correlated directly to the amount of measurable plaque by both direct histopathologic comparison and by direct intravascular ultrasound comparisons. Thus, coronary calcification can help define the extent of atherosclerotic disease. Many people understand that probably for an unstable plaque that it perhaps it is the greater extent of lipid-rich core that may be one of the major participants. However, it is false to suggest that calcification is not present in these same segments. Here is an example of a comparison uh, made several years ago. If you look at the frequency of defining histologic calcification in plaques that were found to have acute rupture, 77% of them had histologic calcification, or only 54% of the stable plaques had identifiable histologic calcifications. However, even though one may then possibly conclude that calcium could be related to unstable plaque, it turns out that the extent of plaque defined in each of these lesions, whether with acute rupture or with a stable plaque, is roughly identical. Thus it's important that even though we can use coronary calcium to help define the extent of plaque, the presence or absence of calcium cannot be defined 
cannot be used to define the potential for plaque instability. Coronary artery calcification measurements actually use a very distinct set of algorithms that were developed in the early 1990s, originally applied to electron beam computed tomography. On the left here is an example of mild calcification in the first diagonal branch of the left anterior descending, where on the right are various methods of determining the amount of calcification. Importantly, there are a number of rules for the traditional Agatston calcium scoring. The field of view should be 26 centimeters. The minimum density to define the presence of coronary calcium has been set at 130 Hounsfeld units or greater. CT collimation is very important and is set at 3 millimeter thick slices. This is of historical importance, even though now with multi-detector CT we can get cross-sectional dimensions on the order of 0.5 millimeters, the 3.0 millimeter cross-sectional collimation is essential because this was the thinnest slice that was available with the original electron beam scanner. In addition, one must have a minimal calcium area which is defined by at least one millimeter squared of calcium or using the field of view of 26 centimeters, roughly three pixels. The Agustin calcium score is not a linear measure of coronary calcium area, but is a area that is multiplied by a density related to the maximum Hounsfield unit density within the particular lesion, multiplying by one, two, three, or four, depending upon the maximum density within the particular segmental area. The volume score was developed several years later in a, an attempt to really reduce the nonlinear relationship with Agatston scoring. This does not involve a multiplication of the uh, extra uh, one, two, or three, four multiplier and is derived in units of area times 10 to the minus third cubic millimeters. Still later, the mass score was developed, which provides a much more precise measure of the actual volume of coronary calcium and also requires no multiplication factor and most importantly is independent of slice collimation. Thus, one could theoretically use one millimeter, two millimeter, or three millimeter thick sections and still derive at the same measurement. However, it's also very important to appreciate that even though the Agatston score is the one that most of us use, we are well aware of the volume and mass scores and they are not mathematically equivalent of the Agatston score. That means that we can't come up with a particular multiplication factor that would say, well, if the Agatston score is 100, then the volume score would be X or the mass score would be Y. Even though the volume and mass scores, in my opinion, are superior measurements, historically the Agatston score has had the most amount of research and the most number of papers published using its particular relationship. Therefore, henceforth in this discussion, we'll be talking about Agatston calcium scoring. Here's an example of the relationship between direct coronary arteriography in terms of maximum stenosis severity and coronary artery calcium score in a selected group of approximately 400 individuals. You can appreciate that as the maximum stenosis severity or the severity of the coronary artery disease was determined at angiography, the higher and the higher calcium scores. Individuals who had no luminal abnormalities in this particular group had mean coronary calcium scores of 12, while individuals with triple vessel coronary disease had mean coronary calcium scores of greater than 1,000. However, just as demonstrated in the very earliest slide that I showed, the relationship between percent stenosis, 
and coronary calcium is very uh, much loose. So one can use the uh, amount of calcium, that is the calcium score, to get an overall estimation of the likelihood of having more advanced obstructive disease. The calcium score is a measure of plaque and the stenosis measurement is a combination looking only at the lumen. Why is plaque severity so important? We have spent so many years discussing coronary obstructive disease. These are examples from two classic papers that have pointed out why plaque severity is more important than stenosis. From the classic Falk, Shaw, Fuster paper, coronary plaque disruption from 1995, they stated the less obstructive plaques gave risk to more occlusions than did the severely obstructed plaques because of their much greater number. From an intravascular ultrasound study done by Kern and Meyer looking at the evaluation of the culprit plaque published in 2001, they stated, because the aggregate risk of rupture associated with many non-significant lesions exceeds that of the fewer significant lesions, a myocardial infarction will more likely originate from a non-significant lesion. Thus, this is more of a statistical relationship. The greater the calcium score, the greater your coronary plaque burden, thus the greater the potential likelihood of you ultimately developing an unstable plaque. One can, of course, look at traditional risk factors such as hypertension, high cholesterol, and cigarette smoking to come up with relationships that deem individual risk. But by using the coronary calcium score, which is highly repeatable, one can see that the greater the amount of calcium score, the greater and greater the overall patient's excess risk. This is an example from a study performed using electron beam at St. Francis Hospital in Long Island, New York. These are groups of individuals who were at risk for having coronary disease but did not have a known severity of coronary disease. That is, they were totally asymptomatic. Many of the patients were put on a particular statin and many patients were left alone to follow them over time. These data demonstrate a general relationship. Looking at annual event rates, if you have a coronary calcium score of zero, the event rate is not zero, but was on the order of a tenth of a percent per year. When we look at traditional Framingham risk, we know that individuals above 2% per year are considered coronary disease risk equivalency. Individuals between 1% to 2% per year are considered to have intermediate risk, and individuals below 1% per year are considered to be low risk. When we look at the coronary calcium score, we are looking at individuals with a 0.1% per year. However, as the calcium score increases, the greater the annual event risk. Once the calcium score exceeds 100, these data suggest that those individuals would also be considered at coronary disease risk equivalency. If we divide patients, all comers with scores above 100 and all individuals with scores below 100, we can see that the relationship of the relative risk for any event is roughly tenfold higher. For a coronary event in particular, it was 11-fold higher. And for any event, including MI and sudden cardiac death, again, about a tenfold increase, increase when you look at individuals with scores at 100 or below, and when you look at individuals with scores at 100 or above. This is a study looking at a five-year follow-up of approximately 10,000 asymptomatic men and women who had undergone coronary calcium scoring. Again, you can see that diabetes mellitus, smoking, and hypertension all provided relative increased risk for all-cause mortality that are consonant with what we understand in cardiovascular disease analysis.
However, looking at the coronary calcium scores, you can see that as the score increased, there was an incremental and significant increase in the relative risk. CT assessment of coronary calcium was found to be independent and incremental to traditional risk factors. This is another study from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, so the MESA study, which looked at 6,800 individuals with a four-year follow-up. This is a mixed ethnic population with Caucasian, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Chinese Americans. The same data as shown in previous slides is exampled here. If you take the lowest calcium scores as a reference range, the higher and higher your placement in individual coronary calcium scores, the higher your individual risk regardless of your ethnic background. This is an example of looking at individuals with very high calcium scores, scores above 1,000. This is a study published in 2002, which will not be repeated. They basically found that individuals who had very high scores, but who were not treated aggressively with medical therapy and were basically left to follow up, that the annual event rate was as high as 25% per year. Now, in retrospect, this seems to be very high, and perhaps it's nowhere near 25%. Perhaps it's half this at 12%. However, even at that relationship, look what the relationship between risk is in terms of finding severe SPECT abnormalities or finding multiple regional wall motion abnormalities on stress echo. Thus, finding a very high calcium score is a very high indicator of subsequent future cardiovascular risk. This is a study looking at 25,000 individuals who were initially asymptomatic, middle-aged individuals followed out about six to eight years. 44% of this general population actually had a zero calcium score, and then the distribution of individuals in this area are shown in the legend to the slide. As you can see, the higher and higher your baseline calcium score, the lower the cumulative survival. One can also look not only at the amount of coronary calcium, but what's called the percentile ranking. That is how your particular calcium score compares with age and gender matched individuals. This is called percentile ranking. This is a study published several years ago looking at the relationship between the prediction of myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death in initially asymptomatic individuals. As you can see, the higher the baseline percentile rank, the higher the overall risk of that patient in developing untoward cardiac events. In particular, once you reach above the 60th percentile for age, you're already getting close to coronary disease risk equivalency at 2% per year. One can also look at receiver operator characteristics or ROC curve relationships showing that traditional risk factors clearly provide information, but even the coronary calcium score percentile provided incremental data to traditional risk factors. Shown here on the left and the right are a set of data originally published in 2001 from a database of 32,000 asymptomatic individuals. These data have been expanded to now greater than 100,000 individuals with very similar relationships between coronary calcium scoring as a function of age and as a function of gender. In particular, the red line in both the left and right graphs define the median coronary calcium score. As you can see, the calcium scores go up with age. If you look at traditional Framingham risk factors, the most powerful predictor of future cardiac risk is actually patient age and patient gender. One can then look at 
the measurement of coronary calcium score as an indicator of the patient's relative cardiovascular age. This information then can suggest that individuals who have scores below the 25th percentile for age may fall into a low risk group. Individuals with scores between the 25th and 50th percentile for age would fall into an average typical Framingham risk assessment group. Individuals with scores between 50 and 75th percentile would have above average risk. Individuals with 75th to 90th percentile would have a high risk and individuals above the 90th percentile for individual coronary calcium scores would have a very high risk profile. This is an overall explanation of suggested guidelines and interpretation. These data were actually derived by a group of individuals in 1997, but only published in 1999. Basically, this forms the basis for the general distribution and suggestions for need for further testing or aggressiveness in medical therapy for individuals. If you have a very low score or a zero score, general recommendations are public health guidelines. If you have a mild score between 11 and 100, your cardiac risk is moderate. And we suggest counseling and risk factor modification, national cholesterol education panel guidelines for cholesterol evaluation. You may or may not want to consider additional risk factors. And even consideration for daily aspirin may be uh, put forward. Once you reach a score above 100 in the moderate plaque area, it is suggested that you fall into a coronary disease risk equivalency with very aggressive LDL, in particular uh, relationships with an LDL target less than 100, and in some individuals with a what I call a tertiary guideline with an LDL less than 70. You may or may not also want to consider exercise testing. And this is a group of individuals in whom CT angiography, if they are symptomatic, may turn out to be a very good avenue of evaluation. If the plaque is above 400 calcium score, this is considered extensive, and some individuals suggest in addition to very aggressive medical management that stress imaging may be appropriate for occult ischemia. By looking at the individual percentile ranking, Basically, if any individual score, if your score ends up being above the 75th percentile for age or gender, move to the next level of aggressiveness, and if it's above the 90th percentile, move two levels of aggressiveness. What about patient adherence with various forms of medical therapy after being counseled? on their CT calcium scans. This is a report put out several years ago uh, demonstrating that the uh, greater the patient's calcium score and thus the uh, influence on the patient in terms of the severity of their uh, plaque formation, the greater the patient's uh, consistency with remaining specifically on statin therapy. Similar trends as a function of calcium score were also seen in adherence to dietary advice and smoking cessation. In summary then, coronary calcium helps estimate plaque burden in a fairly consistent manner and provides risk stratification incremental to Framingham risk score. However, as been shown by previous histologic evaluations, coronary artery calcium defines only about 20% of the total atherosclerotic plaque burden. As we have discussed, CT angiography is a fair method to define the presence of, quote, significant or obstructive coronary disease, but as a superb means of assessing both calcified and non-calcified plaque severity. At present, more research is needed, but if CTA can be improved, we may be able to possibly extend the amount of plaque derived uh, by coronary calcium at 20% up to 80% of the total atherosclerotic plaque burden.
However, further improvements are needed in detector and CT technology in order to improve this measurement, and coronary calcium remains the most widely used, most reproducible, and frankly simplest estimate of plaque burden available, and it does define medium and long-term prognosis. Ultimately, with the full implementation of CT angiography, short-term prognostication, that is, quantification of complex coronary plaque, may well likely be possible.